The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. G'day, Clayton here from Ensemble. Thanks for joining me for this podcast. It's a pleasure to be able to do this from time to time. Hopefully you enjoy. If you're not already on Ensemble, please go to Ensemble.com or find us in the App Store. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can offer clients access to local and international investments. A world where you can engage with clients meaningfully, backed by powerful data and insights with mobile-friendly technology. A world where you can build business efficiencies through scaled managed accounts and bulk reporting. And a world where you can get all the latest news, research and insights to spot the changes that really matter. Wealth is more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. A world of opportunity awaits you at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. G'day, Clayton here from Ensemble. Uh, It was a while ago that Jess uh, took over the podcast with, um, would you call it uh, like with vigor? I was looking for the adjective and I I landed on vigor. I I thought that was pretty accurate. Um, And uh, and one of the first things you did was you interviewed Fraser (laughs) and I really enjoyed that podcast and sort of having you as the host of the you know formerly XY now Ensemble podcast for uh, a bit over a year or around a year, mm-hmm. and um, and now you in that time so much changed for you, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so <laughs> you know every day when I open my LinkedIn now, I'm no longer blessed with just Ben Nash. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's Ben Nash and Jess. And I gotta say, like, uh, it's a lovely new addition to my my LinkedIn feed. So first I guess first and foremost, it's a thank you. The thank you for breaking up Ben after Ben after Ben. Well, thank you, because to be very genuinely sincere, the people that I interviewed were to help us all and me included to actually do the bloody things that they said, which includes personal branding, it includes, you know, authenticity, speaking up. You know, I tried to I tried to actually implement some of the things that I learned. And you might be seeing that on LinkedIn. <laughs> That's awesome. And and uh, like I it's it's one of the hidden it's one of the hidden benefits of, of being a podcast host is that is 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 you're the one that benefits the most as the host because you get to have every single conversation and then the idea of the podcast is so that it's not just you that's benefiting from it it you know it's a scalable way for for many people to learn so um i think it's awesome uh, that that you learn so much um you know by sitting in front of a computer and having conversation um yeah. but the the key part is oh i actually want to get into it so what, so what happened, what changed during the course of the year? And I'm keen to go into it as much as you want to. And then what's happening now? But I guess we can wait till the second half of the podcast to get there. So first and foremost, what changed during uh, 2022 for you? Uh, well, those of you who have been listening to me <laughs> might know that I'll go anywhere and everywhere. So, Clay, you've got full permission to ask me anything and everything. You know, I awesome. tried to set a culture when I did the podcasting of, you know, creating brave spaces where we can ask questions and be vulnerable. And I'm really happy to to talk about that at length today. So 2022 was, for me, a really exciting, amazing, challenging year. It was all the things. So within a 12-month period, and maybe this doesn't sound like a lot from the outside, but tackling it for me was a lot. So I bought my very first house, which was interstate, which was its own (laughs) interesting, unique, amazing experience. I set the wheels in motion to transfer all of my existing members or clients, as you might call them, over to a new financial advisor that joined the Fox and Hair team named Trish Gregory, who is amazing. Um, But that was like breaking up with people that I loved a hundred times over, which was really emotionally taxing and draining. And also finding the right person to do that took a long time and it takes so much trust yeah. Because if you're going to hand over those people, you want to make 
damn sure that they're going to be looked after. And, and that took me a long time to feel um, okay to do. But once I did it, it was amazing and it's gone really well. So I transferred all of my clients. I actually sold out of my interest in fox and hair, which is something that I've been planning for a long time. So I'm probably really happy to share how long that journey took and what the steps look like. Um, but I enacted that. I then decided that um, as a 30 something year old woman who's not married without children, it was the perfect time for me to call my marriage to myself. So I went overseas for eight weeks, which is why there was some dodgy internet podcast in the middle of like, the desert in Morocco. Um, <laughs> so I had a massive proper life break, which I've never done before. I consulted back to Fox and Hair once I came back, did the podcast, started a new business. Yeah, that's a big year. It's right. a really, really big year. And um, let's go back to uh, 2000 and I believe it was 16 when you guys launched Fox and Hair. 17. Close. 17. Okay. And, and so that was, that was a solid six years of your life. It was more because for like three years before we launched, we worked every week Touché. on Fox and Hair. That's a really good point. Yes. Um, and, and so there was a, it was a large setup. There was six years of, you know, actual practicing financial planning. And my first question is, how many years in, because you said it took a long time. So how many years into, let's call it the six years. It was five. It was five. Oh, five years, five years. How how many years into that five years did you realize that you did want to, that you did want to sell out? Uh, We then, so we basically, uh, for those of you who don't know, Glenn and I, who I have such admiration and respect for and love. Same. Like I had dinner yes. with him last week. I just want to make that abundantly clear from the outset. Um, we both worked together at Macquarie. So hard work is not something that we were um, unaccustomed to. We were quite yeah. okay with working hard. What we said when we launched was 12 months. We are going to work our asses off for 12 months. Let's commit. You know, so many businesses don't make it to the 12-month mark. We've got to do absolutely everything that we can because we're moronic in that we've never given advice before. We've never run a business before. And everyone probably thinks we're, we're going to fail. So, like, let's get <laughs> let's get this done. And then we got to the twelve month mark, Clay, and we were like, okay, another twelve months. So then we committed to keep doing it, and like, we were working almost every day. To have a day yeah, off would be a rarity. Yeah, yeah you um, guys worked harder than any other financial planning uh, practice I was aware of. Yeah, and like, let's just also myth us. Like, hustle culture is probably genuinely what you need to get something off the ground, but certainly what, not what you need to keep it going, in my opinion. I so agree. anyway, then we did another 12 months. And by this stage, I'm fraying at the edges when my life admin's taken a toll, like everything that just had deeply impacted me. And I started having conversations with Glenn about like, this can't be it. Like, this can't be how other people are running, are running their businesses. We're clearly doing something wrong. Um, and so we tried and we failed at heap of stuff, implementing new changes, new tech, new people. Yeah. And it basically got to the point where, you know, what I'm really proud of is that we were both able to, the whole way through, be able to be really honest. And I was like, listen, I can't run at this pace forever. And so if this is the pace, we are going to have to have really sincere conversations about what the future looks like. And Glenn was really great about it because he could see that I, I wasn't doing what I and was good at the way that I should have been because I was just afraid. Yes. So it probably got to about three and a half years in and we tried to hire some new advisors. Uh, we hired two at the same time. One has worked exceptionally well and is still in the business and one didn't. And the one not working out for various reasons probably was the moment where I realized the, that, w- that was like my game plan. I was like, okay, we'll just hire advisors. That'll solve all my problems and I'll have them my life back and then when it didn't work out and obviously all that work goes back to you it was just this overwhelming sense of dread and like that's not how you lead that's not how you run a business and so it became really obvious that we had to make some really big structural changes so we worked on the transition and the exit for about 18 months wow it's kind of interesting because my i only had my business for four years so yeah. yeah less less than you and um i think i probably realized around the three and a three and a half month mark maybe three three year mark that that i didn't want to continue running my own practice um slightly different reasons but i think it all it came back to it wasn't exactly what i wanted to do and and i mean i say that 
with full knowledge of what a privilege it is to be able to say that sentence, right? Like I, I totally it, it, it um, but at the same time, it, it genuinely, um, I wanted to do something else. And so at a certain point, you're, you're feeling that you want to do something else. And what did you know exactly what that was? Yeah. So I ignorantly thought that I could build what I want to do inside the business because what I thought would happen, being really transparent, and to your point, these are bloody great problems. Like I sit here knowing how exceptionally privileged I am to have built a business that has done so well and helped so many people. You know, people cried to me when I told them that I was trans. Like I'm very lucky. So I just want to say that out loud in case it comes across as arrogant and stupid. Um, But I thought as the business grows, I can take on less of the stuff that I'm shit at because I am shit at many things that (laughs) sit in the advice wheel and I can lean into the things that I really love. And I really thought ignorantly that that's what we could build and that's why we kept testing and trying all these things. And I ended up saying to Glenn, I genuinely feel like a fish climbing a tree. Wow. Yeah. So I identified and and – we're a beautiful mix of people in that I'm this crazy macro view from a million miles, 27 steps to everyone else. I'm marching in front of everyone into the jungle with no plan, with no map, enthusiasm, like we've got this. And poor Glenn runs behind me, kicking shit up, going, oh my God, team, like, stop. <laughs> stop. You're going the wrong way. But what I could see really, really early on in the business was that Firstly, young people want advice, which in 2017, when we launched, people it was in the middle of the Royal Commission. People were telling me, you guys are idiots. No one's going to pay. I think a survey had come out recently that said people were willing to pay $500 for advice <laughs> only, and we yeah. were like 10 times that. Yeah. So what I saw within the first probably 12 months, actually, is young people want advice. Affluent young people can pay for advice, and they value ongoing coaching. So they were really enormously obvious to me. Yes. We had a wait list. We took on too many clients too soon. We grew too fast and that had enormous challenges. And I was getting more and more frustrated that 50% of the people that waited weeks to sit down and have a really honest, vulnerable conversation about money for the first time, I was turning away. I was turning them away because I couldn't fit them in or I was turning them away because I couldn't let them pay what I needed them to pay to get the advice. I know exactly and, what you mean. Yeah. And that to me, struck a chord so strongly that I have to try to fix this. Yeah. So it's been four and a half years, and bless Glenn, because of course I've been like, hi, I'd like to build another division inside Fox and Hair. (laughs) (laughs) And he's like, do you not think that maybe we should tackle and nail the one that we've got? And so (laughs) it did sit on the to-do list for so long, and it became so important to me that I basically said, Either we have to build this because it's something that I'm so passionate about, or I have to go and build this. And yeah. with his sincere blessing, yeah, we did that because I'm I'm pro advice, Clay. Totally. No, I I, I know. Um, I I was just thinking back actually because I knew we had this podcast on this morning. I was thinking back to when I sold my my business. I didn't I didn't know what I was going to do next. Um, and and the word finfluencer wasn't around back then. But I tried some NAF version of it and it was, it was really bad. And I did a bunch of like videos and I was trying, I was trying to like create these pictures on Pinterest and oh my God, it was, it was, it was a disaster. And, and it didn't actually fit with someone who, like myself, uh, who, who is actually camera shy. I know, I know that it's, it, it comes across as that's disingenuous, but I am. Hence why I love podcasts because it's just oh, audio. Really? Oh, yeah. um, and so, um, and so, since since you know a lot has changed, and and financial educators and things like that have become a proven uh, a proven demand, right? Especially mm-hmm. with with TikTok, I think we'll, <laughs> there are stats around how how much the term influencer or financial educator is getting searched. It is it's out of control. The the numbers are insanely large and so the demand for uh information it is massive and and so this whole financial educator 
um, sort of segment of, and I, I, I don't, I think like most people, I don't know, I don't know how to, I don't exactly know how to describe it yet. Like, is it advice? Is it not advice? And then, you know, for, for if ASIC's listening, I don't want to take a position contrary to you. So we'll, we'll go down whatever path that, that, um, is the official interpretation, but at least there was a bit of a framework for you to follow in that it, they're, they're, it's a proven commodity. And if so, mm-hmm. your, if your skill set matches this demand, then I can definitely see how you put those two and two together to say, hey, wait a second, like the demand is massively outstripping supply. Okay. And I am a financial planner. I'm okay. not some crypto bro. Oh, right. So, so, uh, so if I, and I've seen the pe- the impact that I've had on people's lives and, yeah. and, and if I can do this at scale, then why wouldn't I? Is that, was that kind of the process of how you got there? Exactly that. It was like, when I turn these people away, where am I turning them to? Yeah. And, and honestly, like a lot of the time I was telling them about books to read or podcasts to listen to or ASIC's Money Smart website, which is very good, but doesn't, yeah. if you don't know what you're doing and you need someone to reassure you that you're doing the right thing or just the basic financial literacy, you know, I wasn't going to send them to some TikTok finance bro for totally. genuine, unbiased information. <laughs> yeah. And many of the people didn't want to read the books that are available and that's why they reached out to a human. So totally. Um, it just it just really dawned on me that because we don't teach this at school, because we have generational, you know, money trauma and problems that no one seems to talk about, which I'm sincerely fascinated with. I was like, why don't I mean, classic me, why don't I just do it? Hell yeah. No, but honestly, I I mean in the amount of time sit well, from the time that you decided why don't I do this to the time that you were uh presenting on stage for the AFR. How, 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 like, that's a pretty short journey. Mm-hmm. So you, I guess what I'm saying is you, you've done like remarkably well in a very short amount of time. Thanks, Clay. But again, like what everyone doesn't see, it's the tip of the iceberg situation, right? Like I went away for eight weeks to eat, pray, love my life. I think I read 12 money books. I came home with 43 pages of notes on my course. Like I don't sit still very well i don't not when i see something that i want to do yeah i don't know it's like a moth to a flame i'm like there yes and you know i think also uh i've always enjoyed relationships i highly pride myself on you know my relationship skills it's why i think i did well in corporate and media are not hard to have relationships with i don't think yes I think they're easier than people think. So, yes, it was qu- quite a fast trajectory. Almost out of the blocks, I had like five or six speaking gigs, which was sort of accidental in a lot of ways. Um, but, yeah, it's really exciting and it feels it feels really good. Well, let's maybe jump into exactly what that is. Um, so, your what's your title? Get, get, how, how would you describe what, what it is that, like, how would you describe what it is that you do to, now? And one of the interesting things is I know that you've kept your financial planning license, which I thought was really interesting. I think it gives you a lot of credibility. And one of the things that I would like to see uh, personally, and I'm sure many financial planners would like to see, is that the people that are getting into financial education, financial coaching, influencing, whatever you want to call it, do actually have a pedigree behind them that says that they can do it. That, for mm-hmm. me, that kind of makes sense. Like if this is a version of what financial advice advice is, and again, like I, th- I think there's a lot to sort of figure out exactly what that means. But to me, it makes sense that it's not some crypto bro who who's saying buy this thing over here, but it's someone that's, you know, had a thousand conversations about, hey, what do you want out of life and how do we get money to make those outcomes you know, possible. So, um, how do you describe what it is that you do? And Uh let's kind of get into exactly what it is that you do. I know you mentioned you had a course and let's get into it. Yeah. So just on the license piece, that was really important to me. So, uh, I am a naturally curious person. And so for me to stay educated and, you know, I want to go back, I'm going to go back and do some additional studies next year, um, which I 
completely backbone to f- folks in here because, of, as you may have understood from 10 minutes ago, my brain did not, could not cope uh, with anything <laughs> else. So staying licensed is absolutely a proof point, but it makes sure that I stay educated in the right areas as well, which is a p- important accountability for me. Um, but yes, I do also hope that the majority of people who give what I would call advice online become educated, uh, more educated. Uh, so that was important. My license were license the imperative were amazing. I was so terrified that they were going to like kick me out. Um, <laughs> and I got all of my scripts checked by a, a law firm that specialises in our world. So massive thanks to Simon <laughs> and the team who read all of my scripts, gave me all of the disclaimers. So, you know, I've done this in a way that I want to make regulators happy. I want to make my yeah. licensee happy. I want to make yeah. sure I am being super compliant. Yes. Um, and I want to say things that are genuinely helpful but not veering into personal advice. So I'm very much at this point in time taking a general advice stance and I am about to launch a 10-week financial literacy program. So I don't know what you would call me given that I'm still licensed, but it's not personal advice, maybe financial <laughs> educator. Yeah, I, f- I think that's that's the terminology that they use in the US. And I feel like sure. it's a lot better than Finfluencer. There's something about, I, it's hard to get my Finflu, there's too many Fs. I'm just not a massive fan of the word. And also, if you follow me on socials, you'll know that I'm hardly like <laughs> what they're like. My friends text me and they're like, you have to invest in better setups because your stuff is shoddy. Oh, yes. As, um, but to your point, like about your influencer days, I'm totally okay with stuff that I put out not being perfect because I'm just learning. Yeah. I'm yeah. learning. And it's okay not to be, like I look back at some of them and I'm like, that was ridiculous. And then yeah. I move on and I just get better and that's it. A hundred percent. I even keep a lot of the stuff uh, from those days still online. You know, I think it's got like five subscribers, so no one even knows that it's there. But I do keep it there because it, if nothing else, it'll show that the you know from everyone starts somewhere and everyone looks a little bit silly when they when they put their hand up to say, you know what, I think I I can put my voice into the ring and everyone starts out as self-conscious and then eventually after you've done it for five or six years you Ben Nash you got your pivot hat on your pivot shirt on right. and you've got your your vertical camera set up it's the exact yeah. same shot every time and he's just boom, boom 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 he just knows how to how to rattle it out and and I found I found out the other the other day that he's the most followed financial educator on TikTok in Australia so wow, he, he, that's yeah, he's amazing. really he's really dedicated himself to it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm and and he's still got to practice as well. Although I don't think he gives a lot of uh, personal advice these days. And he's so, just about to launch a book. I just yes. wrote a forward for his book. Did you? You yeah. legend. We're all a team. The more of us that yeah. can help more people, we're totally. not going to resonate to everyone. Absolutely, like. I love him. And he no doubt has done stuff in the past that would have been very av. No offense, Ben. I'm just sure. making this up. But like, we should be proud of our journey. Yeah. And we have such tall poppy syndrome in Australia that we look at things that are a tiny bit shit yeah. and we're like, wow, that was shit. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, but what are you doing? Yeah, totally. Uh, it's, it, I, I think if I, if I think back to before I started my first business and I was getting into business, I realized that I was a self-sabotaging perfectionist. And it, it was a it was a bit of a, a mind maze to figure out, but it was essentially I never wanted to have to look into the mirror and say, I tried my best and I failed. So um, if I felt like I was getting close to failing, I would do some kind of self-sabotage, maybe don't try as hard or maybe, you know, do something silly or or whatever it was, but I realized it was so that I could never have to look in the mirror and say, I tried my hardest and I still failed. It it, it was like almost a, a, a buffer zone that I created for myself so that I, if I ever failed, I could look in the mirror and say, well, look, I failed, but it was because I did this other thing, which, you know, mm. if I was really trying, I wouldn't have done. And I realized it was a, pr- a protection mechanism 
And so, uh, so over time, like I, I certainly, I decided that I was, no, I was going to try as hard as I can. And for every single failure, I'm going to look in the mirror and say, that's okay. It was, it was a big change. so hard. That's so hard. so hard. Yeah. I had to do some really deep learning about vulnerability. Mm. You know, I grew up with a mother who is a matron, like a literal, was well, a literal, like army, think army major, but in a yeah. woman. And like, you don't make mistakes. You yeah. don't fail. Wow. You do things properly and you get it. She worked in healthcare. So like, you make yeah. a mistake, someone dies. And so yeah. that's brilliant in that context. That's yes. shit when you're teaching your children how to be adults <laughs> in the world. And yeah. so I possibly similar to, similarly to you, you know, Clay, when I was in kindy, yeah. this is a ridiculous story, but I think it's helpful in case you're the same. I used to go home on like a Monday or Tuesday night, whenever they hand out homework, and I used to do the whole week's worth. And I used to bring it into the teacher because I wanted to have the teacher check my homework before I submitted it on the Friday. Oh, whoa. Yep. That's how scared of failure I was. They called my mom into the office. <laughs> And they were like, we're just a little bit worried about Jess. And I thought I'd hacked the system. I'm like, you guys are morons <laughs> waiting till Friday to then find out that you've made a mistake. Hand it in early. Hand it in early. Get it pre-checked. Make sure it's right. And then hand it in. And the teachers were like, no, Jess, this is not how it works. I was like, but why? Why? This is clever. Anyway, and so they actually said to my mum, we think she's got a problem with making mistakes. And your mum's like, that's like, it, right? <laughs> Yeah, she doesn't make mistakes. What do you mean? Um, and starting Fox and Hair was the first, because when you work in a big team, you can niche so well that you just do your thing really well and you yes. can make mistakes. And I definitely made mistakes in corporate, don't get me wrong. Sure. But when you run a small business, you cannot hide yep. anywhere. And so the level of like failure and the rate of failure, if you aren't ready to deeply look inside and be okay with mucking up many things don't start a business don't do anything that puts you out on a limb yeah but you know i love brene brown she's like being my quasi therapist through um podcast <laughs> she says courage over comfort and i really love that yeah uh tim ferris this is a long time ago i used to be a fanboy and he said in one of you know one of his books um be okay with small things going wrong and just that real simple sentence i was like Ooh. Yeah, it is. It's it's all right. Like, mis- yeah, mistakes are totally totally okay. And so you you're you're in, you're you're in the early stages. Uh, so you you you're making some mistakes at the moment. Let's call it that. Where but where is where is kind of like the three years from now? So um, what what is what is the current trajectory? And I don't. I'm not asking you like to to describe where you're going to end up with this because as we just covered you, you, you're, you're, you're you know macro 27 steps ahead right so and there's a lot that can change in that time but okay. so maybe maybe an interim of say three years where is where is where is the trajectory taking you and where would at the moment where would you like to see yourself in like say three years in terms of impact uh, and numbers of people and things like that. I have a 10-year plan. <laughs> so oh, oh let's go. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go 10-year. Let's go 10. I want to help 25,000 young Australians learn and feel good about money. That's my plan. I'd love to help many more than that, but I feel like that's a big enough number for me to have a good, you know, get my teeth stuck into it. Yes. Uh how I deliver that, obviously with changing technology, who the hell knows what that'll look like in 10 years. But I feel like if I can step back in 10 years and know that there is a young generation of people who feel confident talking about money, who have learned things that they never thought that they could learn or do things that they never thought they could do, that is enormously um, impactful. And I want to get them ready for getting advice because I know that the next generation of people in the next 10, 20, 30 years they're going to have piles of money lumped on them, probably in very emotional circumstances and possibly not be equipped to know how to manage that wealth. Think the people who win the lotto or whatever. Like if we have this intergenerational transfer of wealth and advice is still seen in, you know, no offense, but the pale male style world and we've done no work on giving people basic levels of financial literacy, 
I genuinely feel as, as a profession, we've got a lot to answer for because we know that this is coming. We know that people who get big lump, uh, lumps of money with no training or understanding of what to do don't manage it well. Um, and so I'm, I'm genuinely hoping that I can create a space. And look, I did this through Ladies Talk Money as well. Like I want to make talking about money a taboo, like the last taboo. I want that gone. Mm. I want people to, I want to normalize talking about money. Yeah. 25,000 people, 10 years. I, like, yeah. I mean, I got a feeling you're going to shoot that out of the water. That's, that's my initial thought. Um, that's good because it scares the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how are you going to do it? Like, what's your, what does a, cli- okay, what does a client look like to you? Right? Yeah. And how do you anticipate finding them and attracting them? So at the moment, my I've built a 10-week basic beginner's financial literacy course for people who I think will be between 18 to 45-ish who aren't ready, can't afford financial advice. Yep. Um, I'm taking on 50 as my first initial cohort in uh, Fed because I want to test and learn. I'm a big believer in testing and learning and, and changing. Yep. Um, and then I want to do two more open-ended 10-week courses. So I'm capped this calendar year. Obviously, if you can get people to learn the basics, then I anticipate that there'll be situations where they want to learn about a particular niche topic. And so I can see opportunities to do small, short courses for people who inherited some cash, are pregnant, are going yep. through young and going through a divorce. Like a lot yep. of my girlfriends in their 30s are going through a divorce and you know, talk about that from a monetary perspective. So I can see that over time I can build more courses that are sort of life stage specific and I'm building an ongoing monthly accountability club because I think we all know it's one thing to learn about this stuff, but if you don't have someone keeping you to account, it's the fitness plan that gets dusty as you get fat. Oh, look, if information was all that we needed, we'd all be billionaires oh. with six packs. So, no, uh, so I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, and, and so a client to you is someone that's doing a course? Yeah. Cool. Someone who pays, at the moment, who pays for uh, the 10-week program. And then once they finish that program, they have the option to stay on as part of that monthly accountability club, which from a price point is not a profit. It's not a, sure. it's not a money maker for me. It's genuinely yep. so they show up. So I'm talking like 30 bucks a month. Right. Okay. Would you have Would you have these courses on demand or you have intakes that go through together? Intakes. And cool. the reason for that is, like everything we know, people know that they need to get their money shit sorted. Yes. And if we, for me, and I might ch- I might change this, but I feel like without creating a club where people are doing it at the same time, yep. they lack the community insight, they lack the community chatter, yep. and they have the best intentions and they pick it up when they have time, which is yep. never. Yes. I don't think that that works. I, I fully experience. agree with I fully agree with you, and and um, that's why I was asking the question because I think it's a very important question. The concept of on demand turns out most people just don't value it at all because it just will never get with even close to the top of the top of the to do list. It's it's why when we do these virtual uh, all license CPD day that we do not release a recording at the end. There's no, there's no, and the scarcity, and it is scarcity, and the reason why uh, we use the tool of scarcity is so that you bloody do it. Yeah, because you got to. Uh, if, if, if we say, hey, we're doing this event, but we'll release the video after the event, and you can watch it anytime you want, a quarter of the people are, are, going, are going to do it. Whereas if you say, this is the only time it's ever getting shown. It's the only time it's going to be done, and it has to be at this time. And you've got ample warning. It, it's amazing how many more people will do it. Totally. And so to that point, and look, I'm that. I'm that person. Things so, sit onto same. my to-do list. Yeah. I have the best intentions. If I did all the things that my intention list told me to do, oh my god, I'd be I would be such a different person. So to that point, <laughs> what I am doing is I'm going to release a topic every week, so that cool. you've got to keep up. Cool. And That's there cool. is a community call with me. And I also think community is an interesting concept here because I feel that money is such a lonely road for yes. so many people and they feel yes. such shame talking about it. You know, what is it? Eight in 10 people feel uncomfortable talking to their closest friends about money. Yeah, wow. But if you can create a community that are going through the same lesson 
trying to figure out the same stuff, hard stuff at the yes. same time. Yes. I don't think for all of the privacy reasons that we know of, I don't think that that exists very well in our world. And I want to bring that in because the power of people sharing their learnings and, and their failures and their, their efforts, yep. I think really motivates people to get cracking for themselves. I think it's going to be really, I'm, I'm interested to see how much the community is, whether I genuinely feel in time, it'll become more valuable than the things that I'm actually talking about. Yeah. And which is the, I mean, it, it's a great goal if, if and when you would, it's a very, if I, I'm just thinking about ensemble. And because, that's exactly who I've modeled it off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because, because, because the, the moment that, uh, we sort of stepped away from sort of, you know, o- owning every single piece of content, or I, I guess probably the way to think about it is the more that content is user generated, the more accurate it is at the end of the day, because people are talking about the legitimate concerns or, or interests or things that they want to explore. And then those that have some level of experience or are following the same journey um, can converse. And that, it, it, especially because the bigger that that becomes, um, the harder it is to, I guess, make it appropriate for everyone. But here's the other crazy thing that I've learned, and this might be relevant, is that um, if, if, you look at, if you look at these platforms, call them, that have a high level of usage, it's not because everything on there is always relevant to the person looking at it. And it, that's counterintuitive at first, but it's a really interesting concept because um, finding the thing that's relevant to you in amongst other things that aren't is just as rewarding. It, in fact, it's more rewarding than it just being delivered to you because you're in control of finding the thing that's relevant to you. It's a it's a really interesting concept. Um, and yeah, I'm definitely happy to talk about it uh, more with you if, if that's the path that you're going down. It's not that I know everything about. It's just an interesting concept that I've thought about over the last couple of years because it, it's one of those things that we're constantly battling. It's like, do you, do you make every single, like, do you niche a platform down or, or a community down so that, every, so that it is maximum value for each person that turns up at all times, or do you provide an environment that people can wander and search for themselves? And and yeah, the research kind of lands on the latter, which is super counterintuitive. Because if it was up to me, I would like I'd be like, oh, everything has to be like insanely value, high value, immediate access. That's like where my mind goes. But it it turns out that's not necessarily how people want to learn, which is kind of interesting. I, so first up, a massive thanks to M. Blanche because no one has built communities oh, like my God. Totally. y'all. Yeah. So I reached out to her last year and was like, hi, <laughs> you built communities so yeah. well, yeah. teach me. And so yeah. I had a session with her and if anyone that has had interactions with her knows how she's the, the most amazing um, person. But I also think t- to your point, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm still absorbing what you're saying, but I think we are naturally, most people are naturally curious, particularly on a platform like yours, because we yeah. go there to learn and we don't know what we don't know. And so there is that element of curiosity of like, what are other people doing? What are other yes. people learning about? And this is not what I came for, but now you've scratched my itch and you've picked my interest. And so I can sort of see just thinking how my brain works, why that makes complete sense. But it does go against everything that you would expect you need to build it in the way of. absolutely and and yeah I, I've spent some time on it simply because uh you know when we first launched the platform about three years ago yeah we we made it ultra niche and there were like unique journeys depending upon you know how far you were into your advice career what role that you had what your specialities were like we went super niche and then it dried up and we went what did we do wrong? <laughs> I thought I thought that I what I delivered was precisely what people wanted. But then, yeah, I I then went and uh, sort of backwards engineered again. Speaking about failures, then and pivoting and learning and testing, like that was a huge one for us. I think this is also interesting if you have a marketing strategy and you're starting to use tech to really niche down on the content and get really specific about segmenting your content of your client base. Well, with emails, it's different. Oh, for God's sakes. So email. Teach us. So email, you have to be precise. Oh, okay. All right. But then they can wander once they're in. 
Correct. Uh-huh. So it, 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 it's almost there's a juxtaposition in so people will people will only react inside of an email because the threshold for action is so high because everyone hates their inbox. It's the worst place in everyone's life. So in order to get through to someone via email, it has to be pinpoint pinpoint accuracy. Like our our email uh, our emails. Even, are even sent out at a time in the day that you're most likely to engage. <laughs> what platform do you use to send emails? Uh, Active Campaign, but but we do huge amounts of tests. So like when a when a new person joins the platform, we'll send them an email at a certain time of the day for the week, and then the next week it'll be a certain time of the week a day, and then for the third week it'll be a certain time of the day, and then we we figure out when most likely someone wants to engage in emails. And so they they join that bucket, let alone the role, let alone the interest. Like we've got probably a hundred segments of, of of email lists, which is wild. And so the more accurate you are on email, the more likely you are to get an action. But when it comes to the platform, you don't you don't continue that strategy. You actually give people they go there for what they came for, but then you get out of their way, and there's a bunch of other things for them to play around with. So I have now taken over this podcast, just <laughs> to clarify. So your A-B testing at an individual yep. level, what time of day someone is most likely to open the email. Then yes. based on three weeks of data, you yep. then map them to a particular group and you niche down based on continual interest of whatever they're clicking in. So you're right. ending up with however many subgroups divided by what their exact niche interest is. And yes. after the A-B testing, what the time of day is that gets them best. Yes, exactly. That when their energy to tackle their inbox is at their highest, it's I think we all just took something from that. <laughs> it's it, yeah. The, and and because we've done so much, like a little company is uh, very advanced in emailing, and so and and what's really weird, yeah, is is that the platform is the complete opposite. It's it's not designed. It's it's based on country, and by virtue that it's about financial planning that that is the niche but other than that get out of get out of people's way and then the purpose of the emailing is to be like here are the precise things that you that might be of interest to you and then and yeah it's really interesting but we can definitely chat about it more i've got a lot to share in this space brilliant taking you up on that okay sorry i've already no. our conversation as for usual <laughs> um all right so i want to i want to i want to end with um so you're you're you've gone on such a huge journey from Macquarie through to now, you know, being a financial educator and growing and selling a business in between. Right now, are you in a position where if you could go back in time and tell your younger self that you've made overall, while while there may be failures in between, but overall you've made the right decision. So that that's that's my first question. What advice would you give to your younger self? But then the other is, and this is kind of more interesting. What's the older version of you giving you advice today? So that you today for younger, and then future you to you today. As you might have seen on LinkedIn, I just did a small little post about what I would tell twenty-year-old Jess. That's right. This seems very relevant. Um, and broadly, I said, you know, you're going to work like you never thought you could and it will be really hard but ultimately it will be really good some of the things that I reflected on you know um, for me I took this this break where I've never I've never stopped before so it gave me a lot of opportunity to really self-reflect and do all of the things that I think we should all do as humans but we get so busy being busy we don't do the most important things which is wildly ironic Um, I would go back and tell Jess to take more risks earlier glenn had to pry me out of corporate like we did for on a date and i can still remember it we were sitting at this morrison's i think it's called on george street and he's like it's time like this is the date we'd agreed on and i was like no um so you know i i'm naturally a very that it's that it's that perfection piece i think that comes back to you know unless something's fully thought thought through or i have all the answers or it's deeply within my control i feel uncomfortable and so i would tell myself to remind myself of un- how unhelpful that is and so fail more take more risks try stuff just try stuff and be totally okay with the fact that it's not all gonna land well 
And not everyone's going to like you. Not everyone needs to like you. You know, I think I've always been a fairly confident person and I feel that feel like that's put me in good stead. Um, but yeah, I think my big ones would be take more risks. I also very recently have discovered that I have ADHD. <laughs> I say discovered, but anyone that knows me quite well will like probably legitimately? not. Legitimately? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm part of the growing cohort that everyone now has ADHD. <laughs> um, getting medicated has changed every fiber within me. And that is so very recent. And I can't, I feel so sad that I went through so much pain and trauma. Cause if you have it, you know, that things that are normal to people really are. So I would tell my younger self to like get therapy, be honest when things are not, this, not right and go and figure out what the hell is going on. And, and don't, I was, I actually said no to medication, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, which I deeply regret. So that's the advice that I would give younger Jess. The advice that older Jess would probably give me is to remember that this is my one only precious life and that it is my job to steer my life in the direction that I want it to go in. No one is coming to save me from myself. No one is going to rip me out of bed at 5.30 in the morning to get my ass into gear, to do the things. No one's prying chocolate out of my hands or turning off the Netflix instead of opening a book. Like I have to remember that I am in control in most instances that I have a choice and that work is an element of my life, but it's not who I am as a person. And I need to decouple my worth as a human and my success in my work or business from each other because they are totally not the same. Older Jess is very smart. Older Jess needs younger Jess to just do the things that older Jess wants to do. I'm trying though. I'm really trying. I'm I'm really like, I can't actually, I know that I've already said this, the podcast guests I had on over the last 12 months, I think about all the time, whether it's Paul who does phone calls to and from the office to save time, whether it's Felicity who reads a book a week, you know, um, Carly who talks about being authentic, like those people burned elements of what they do well into my brain. Yeah. And it just shows you, like, if you listen to people and you're ready to do hard work, yeah, you can change. Things can change. Older Jess, I, I think old. I need older Jess on speed dial as well when it's like <laughs> 11.30 at night and I'm watching YouTube and older Jess says, go to bed. I go, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, I, I want to thank you so much for getting a chance to work with you. Um, you were an amazing host for us and um i think uh i think what you brought to advisors was something really unique and i'm just ecstatic that we were able to share that information and now as you move into more and more your financial education work i'm really pumped for you and i think this is perfect for you and i think you're gonna nail it so um yeah i'd i'd be so if whoever is hosting the podcast a year from now, I got so, I got someone in mind actually, um, that if we could get an update, that would be awesome. A massive thanks to you. Clay gave me this role of podcast host and I said to him, what am I, like, give me some guardrails. Like, what am I allowed? What do you want me to talk about? What's my theme? Like, you know, and he's like, you do whatever you want. And I did whatever <laughs> I wanted. Yes. Um, and he, I think he said to me, like, I've learned that I just, Pick good people and I get out of their way. And I, hell yeah, you got out of my way and let me do. And I'm sure that sometimes I interview people and you were like, what is she doing? But I no. want to say sincerely thank you. Um, I learned a lot. I've implemented a lot. I've changed a lot. I've stressed Kieran out, the editor, out more than I can even admit. So a huge thank you to Kieran, who was basically um, my beautiful nagging mother to make sure that I was on time and did all the right things. Um, and I think the power of consistency every week, I got the privilege of hosting someone and, and, and being able to, to listen. And I couldn't have done it without them showing up and being really honest and vulnerable. So for anyone that's listening, if anything that I've said today around learnings and vulnerabilities and massively failing, massively feeling overwhelmed, if that resonates with you and you want to have a private chat, please reach out to me. I'm so about wow. it. I also just want to remind people 
I'm so pro with that. I hope yeah. people come out feeling financially literate, start getting sorted, and then want to level up, and then they go and see you, and they understand why they need to pay for your advice. They yes. totally get it. Like, I'm really excited. So, massive thanks. Happy to be on in 12 months. Hopefully, older Jess has fully implemented all of her advice. Awesome. Well, thanks for today. Thanks, Clay.